Hey guys, happy Friday! Welcome back to my channel for Crimes Through the Times. In my Tuesday video, we talked about the serial killer known as the Santa Rosa Hitchhiker Killer and how it was unsolved. And I love seeing what everybody thought about that video, and I love knowing that a lot of people uh, didn't know about it. Or I know people also mentioned that the video is really long, it's like 45 minutes. But I'm back today with a much shorter video, and it's going to be the unsolved murder of Elsie Parabek. Elsie Parabek was born as Aliska Parabek and she was born in April of 1906 in Chicago, Illinois. Her mother's name was Carolina Vohakova Parabek and she was born on November 26th of 1869 and her father's name was Frant Frantiskic Parabek, and he was born on December 15th of 1867. He went by his nickname of Frank. So Frank and um, Carolina, they were born in, in the um, Austria-Hungary, which is part of the Czech Republic. Frank came to the United States in 1882, around the age of 15, which is known as immigration, so he could have a better life. Ten years later, Frank traveled back to his home country in 1892 when he married Carolina in her Czech village and brought her back to the United States with them and they settled in Chicago, Illinois. While living in the Chicago area, Frank started working as a painter and Carolina was a homemaker. The couple were raised Catholic back in the Czech Republic, but they left their faith to become free thinkers. And they were not baptizing their children, which is a big thing with the Catholic religion. You have to baptize your children in order to be, for them to be known as being pure and uh, full of, um, empty of sin, I guess you could say. So the, re the um, reason they did this is they also did not register their kid's birth, like have a birth certificate. And this is why it was very difficult to figure out when Elsie's birthday really was. Elsie was actually the couple's ninth or tenth child, and back during that time period, it was common to have a lot of children. Actually, Elsie had three older siblings who ended up dying very young. And the Chicago newspapers talking about Elsie's case, they usually spelled the Parabek family's last name without the O. And Frank's name was said to have been John or Peter, and Carolina's name was listed as Mary, and Elsie's name was published as Emily and it stated that this was possibly done in a way to Americanize them so people would care more about her disappearance. On the morning of April 8th of 1911, Elsie tells her mother that she's going to go visit her auntie and this was Carolina's sister named Julia Trampota. Julia lived only around the corner from where the Parabek family lived on 2325 South Troy Street. She made her way onto Troy Street and Elsie actually runs into her nine-year-old cousin named Josie who is Auntie Julia's child. Josie was with a bunch of other kids and they were all listening to this organ grinder. An organ grinder is actually a mechanical street organ that was often used in Germany with sometimes the more elaborate ones had dolls that would dance like puppets and stuff. And this also would have the percussion equipment on this and this was a very popular form of entertainment for the children, especially when it came to street performers. So the other children, they start following the organ, um, organ grinder down the street as if they were enchanted by his music. And Elsie, she was left behind. She didn't want to follow them. And several hours later, Carolina decides to call up her, well not call up, but right, go over and to pick up Elsie over at uh, Auntie Julia's house. And she should have already been there, but Carolina is absolutely horrified when she finds out that her daughter never even arrived there. Soon the ladies, Julia and Carolina, they decide not to worry because they assume that Elsie had just spent the night with a friend and she was going to be home the next morning. Elsie was a very popular and outgoing young lady and she was said to have a lot of friends even though she was only five years old. By 9 p.m. that night Frank comes home from work to a hysterical Carolina and he tells she tells him that Elsie is missing. So Frank he travels to the uh, Chicago police station to file a missing persons report but the police just shrugged it off because Elsie must have been spending the night with a friend and that the family was just overreacting. They would just need to calm down. 
when Elsie had not returned by the following morning, that's when the police are like, oh, you know, maybe we actually have an issue. And the police chief captain named John Mahoney, he took over the search personally for Elsie. Right away, the local Romanian people, they were suspected right off of being behind Elsie's abduction. Back in the day, Romanians were known as gypsies. And they would travel around with covered wagons. So... Romanians who were gypsies were said to not have followed a single certain faith, but they learned to adopt into the cultures of the other countries that they were living in. So there was this huge misconception with the gypsies that they had act they were going they were people who lured children away or they kidnapped children to raise them as their own and they especially loved, you know, little girls with blonde hair and blue eyes. And there was a neighborhood child who actually lived close to Elsie's family. And his name was John Jarowski. John, he tells the detectives he sees a gypsy wagon that was on Troy Street. And there was two women inside that was holding a little girl. And it seemed like she was trying to get away, like she was restrained. Detectives were very interested in his claim because Elsie had, like I said, had been last seen on Troy Street. John also noticed that the little girl he saw in the wagon was being restrained by the two women. And that she had been struggling to try to escape them. This alarmed the Chicago police because they had this bunch of gypsies who were kidnapping children. That's what they were thinking. So they ended up searching all these gypsy camps to see if they could find Elsie anywhere they could. Residents from the Des Moines River area claimed they had noticed that there was one wagon that actually left on April 9th, 1911, which was one day after Elsie had gone missing. Police start realizing that Elsie's disappearance is actually very similar, practically identical to the disappearance of Lillian Wolf, and she was actually kidnapped and found with gypsies back in the year of 1910, 19, not 1910, 1907, sorry. Inspector Healy of the police department in, ordered all drainages to be checked for Elsie's body because they didn't know if possibly they could have been murdered, she could have been murdered by the gypsies. On April 15th of 1911, the Illinois state governor asked the public to help search for Elsie, rescuing her if possible and returning her to her family. People don't know what to look for or who, where to start searching for her and they begin to start fearing the worst because they can't find her anywhere. So this was when Elsie's friend, 14-year-old Emma Kubat, stated she originally had seen Elsie with the organ grinder who was there on April 8th, 1911, the day... Elsie disappeared and there was also a young girl who was matching Elsie's description who was walking around with the unknown organ grinder in April 12th on in the April 12th 1911 newspapers and the April 17th 1911 newspapers photos of Elsie and the whole family started getting posted in the news in order to find little Elsie see if they'd be able to see if they could find her through the pictures see if they could match a face to the pictures. During the investigation to find Elsie, two local investigators joined Frank to start looking for the gypsy wagon that had taken Elsie. It was believed that this wagon had been heading to a place called Round Lake, Illinois, which was a gypsy village that was nearly 50 miles away from Chicago. And when the gypsies were asked about Elsie, they managed to catch up to them and ask them, hey, where's Elsie? I gave back my daughter. They quickly packed up and they traveled 43 miles away from Chicago to Bolo. There were several residents in Volo who noticed that there was a little girl traveling with them that had resembled Elsie. And the little girl seemed to act like she was being drugged and she was carried, covered up halfway with a blanket. She just seemed like she was very lethargic. The detectives traveled to where the gypsies were and in order to find where uh, Elsie, but once they arrived, the gypsies packed up their caravans and they quickly traveled to McHenry. Illinois, which is where the investigators caught up with them for a third time to investigate the little girl and that's when they noticed the little girl was actually a gypsy child and did not even match or even resemble Elsie's description. There were several other times that witnesses reported to the police about supposed sightings of Elsie and someone noticed a young child and this child st so strongly resembled Elsie that that her own father, Frank, had to be persuaded that this child was not her, his daughter. It was not. And he, it was just very devastating for him. He did not like that at all. The Chicago police state um, to reporters that they were personally believed that the reason why 
Elsie had been abducted by gypsies or whomever it was was because of her beauty and she was a four-year-old little girl with large blue eyes she had ch pale skin chubby cheeks and she had dimples with beautiful blonde ringlets and it was stated that Elsie was actually so beautiful that people would stop their wagons and compliment her beauty on April 17th of 1911, the Chicago police received an anonymous tip that there was a young girl who was matching Elsie's description at a unknown uh, Illinois hotel with an unknown man. The detectives, they traveled to the hotel in order to investigate this tip, but they were unable to find any evidence that Elsie was there at all. Police start to question the ransom note that the Parabek family had received, and it was begging them for $500, which was about $13,000 back in 2015. The police denied that the family had even told them about the note. They were acting like they had no idea who it came from. On April 20th of 1911, several neighbors who lived by the family noted to police that they had seen Elsie's brother, Frank, Junior, who was six at the time, carrying a shovel and he was walking down the street. The neighbors were confused as to why Frankie was carrying the shovel and they asked him what he was doing. So Frankie tells the neighbors that there was a construction work in the area and it was possible that Elsie could have fallen down the construction hole and got stuck and he was sent to go and dig her out. So I just don't understand why the family sent a six-year-old little boy to go and find a five-year-old girl that would have been fallen into a hole. I mean, I just, I don't understand the logic of thinking there, but to each their own, I guess, you know, as long as he's helping out. The construction workers thought that it could have been possible that the girl had fallen into the hole, but they thought if they would have noticed if a child did in fact fall into the hole. So they were, they just told him that there was like no one that could have been down there. On the second week of the search for Elsie, there was a local 11 year old little girl. Her name was Lillian Wolf and she came forward to help with the search for Elsie. Lillian had actually been abducted by a gypsy family a few years prior in order to be raised by the family. She had been found by a family who was passing by and they noticed Lillian was walking behind this covered wagon as a beggar. When it came to the search of Elsie, Lillian even brought up her ex experience as a kidnapping victim and even volunteered to lead the search parties in hopes of finding Elsie. One of Lillian's previous kidnappers had even suggested to Lillian and the police to start asking to uh, Elijah George, who was the king of the gypsies, whether or not he knew where Elsie was. He was subsequently arrested and then he was questioned about the disappearance of Elsie and he didn't even talk about her because he had no idea who she was. So he just was like, um, no, I'm not involved in her disappearance. I don't know who this Elsie chick is. I don't know who a little girl with blonde hair. I don't know who this is. The police chief inspector named Inspector Healy, remember I mentioned him earlier, he ordered the local canal in Chicago called the Chicago Sanitary and Ship Canal to be dragged to find her body and any chance that it could have been down the canal. Along with having the wells and mine shafts checked because there was a possibility that she could have been walking around and she could have just fallen into a well or fallen into a mine shaft and she was unable to get out. And so they wanted to search in there to see if she was able to be rescued. There was a young man named John Mutz and he was a Czech immigrant. And he was living in the area who claimed to have talked to a young blonde girl who lived, who was with a uh, gypsy camp. What's really compelling is that he had spoken to this little girl in a Czech language and she had, according to John, introduced herself as Elsie. On April, 28, April 23rd of 1911, there was a local neighbor who tells police that she had actually last seen Elsie the day that she had vanished and Elsie had been talking to the organ grinder and another man. So this completely blew the whole gypsy theory out of the water. Just a few days after Elsie's abduction, Frank Parabek started receiving these insulting letters from an unknown person. He opened the letters and he noticed that they were all actually written in English and he cannot read English or really speak it very well. So he had to call someone, one of his neighbors who did speak English and understand it to read it back to him. So the neighborhood stated that the person had actually taken Elsie, 
who had taken Elsie had actually hated the Parabex and thought they were doing a really bad job of raising her and had been abusing her. Apparently the letters had actually pissed off Frank so badly that he took the letters and he started burning them in his fireplace. And correct me if I'm wrong, I understand this was back in like the early 1900s, but it's considered evidence and you're burning crucial evidence. I understand you're pissy, but please, you shouldn't have done that, Frank. <laughs> the local Czech families, they stood behind the Parabek family and support during the times that they were receiving these hateful letters. There were several people who even decided to go undercover as, uh, I believe they went as gypsies and they went undercover as gypsies to go and find Elsie, but these attempts proved to be failures. By May 7th of 1911, there were 25 gypsy camps that had been searched and there were so many false leads about where Elsie could possibly be and there was absolutely no sign of Elsie anywhere. The family is just heartbroken, torn apart. They had no idea where their little girl was. There was no evidence that she was anywhere. Everything just seemed to be coming de to dead end after dead end after dead end. And the police captain, Captain Mahoney, he publicly announced that he felt that he believed that Elsie was no longer alive. The local judge ordered a criminal investigation of Elsie's parents done to see if there was any reason why, like anything in their past to make someone want to kidnap their child and think that they were bad parents. Remember, because they let sent that, uh, that note saying that they thought that they were bad parents and not raising Elsie very well. But nothing had been found in the background check that could lead them to think that the, they were bad parents. Two days later, on May 9th of 1911, there was an engineer named George T. Scully, and he worked at a local Lockport power plant, which was 35 miles away from Chicago. He and several other employees were doing their own thing. They were just doing their job, doing what they needed to be done, when they noticed a body floating in the canal. When they saw this body, everyone just assumed that it was the deceased body of an animal. So they tell George, hey, you know, can you go pull this animal's body out of the water? We're trying to see if we can get all this uh, taken care of with our job. We can't have this uh, animal body floating in the water. It's just not right. So George goes in and he goes to pull out this animal from the water that they, and that's when they realized that this was not the animal, the body of an animal, but it was the body of a little girl. The body was very badly decomposed and it fit the description of little Elsie. The police then traveled to the Parabek home and when they arrived, Carolina begged police to tell them that Elsie was alive. They ignored her and they had Frank travel back with them to the Goodale Funeral Home where they positive, he positively identified the deceased body that was floating in the river as his five-year-old daughter, Elsie Parabek. Frank had declared right away that Elsie had been brutally murdered. It was then said that Carolina, when she heard this, when she went to go with them to back to the funeral home, she had just ran out of the funeral home screaming on the top of her lungs that Elsie had been murdered and it must have been the gypsies who took Elsie and killed her. Carolina was actually so worked up that Frank had to console her on a trolley train going back to their home. She was unable to get calmed down that quickly. The coroner of the Chicago area he begged for there to be a full autopsy done on Elsie's body because they fit. he as well believed that she had been murdered. There was no way she could have just fallen in the water and just showed up there. And two doctors, they start to examine her lungs and they declare that even though Elsie was found in the river, there was no water in her lungs. So she had not drowned at all whatsoever. However... The Dr. Kingston said that Elsie had been raped and murdered before her body was thrown into the river. Because of this information from the autopsy, he believed that Elsie had not, not been kidnapped 
by gypsies, but instead by a sexual predator. The Dr. Kingston then puts her cause of death as suffocation before sending her body back to the family for Elsie's funeral. Her funeral occurred on May 12, 1911 at 10 a.m. on the front lawn of the Parabek family home, where about 5,000 people had attended. The man who covered the funeral service his name was Rudolf Jaromir Pashenka, and he spoke in his news article that the police needed to find Elsie's killer. The undertakers, they started to put the coffin into the hearse to be uh, wheeled back to where they were going to bury her in the cemetery. And this was when Carolina had actually tried to climb into the hearse to pull her daughter's body from it and take her home and just see her one last time. The family had to actually physically drag Carolina away and when she did this she started screaming on the top of her lungs and she was just absolutely hysterical. The Chicago police chief wanted to desperately find the killer of Elsie and had even increased the reward money to $200 which like I said was a hell of a lot of money back then. Detectives soon have their very first suspect and they announce his name as Joseph Conesti. Joseph Conesti was a local hermit and he lived in a hut by the canal. And a hermit is defined as someone who lives in solitude or seclusion that could either be done due to religious reasons or mental health reasons, but either way he was living there by himself. And it was said, or rumored as I should say, that this guy Joseph has been known to lure these children into his hut and just do inappropriate things to them. When the police go and investigate his shack, they notice that Joseph had a green hair ribbon laying on the floor of his shack and the police actually assume that this belonged to Elsie. On May 10th of 1911, Joseph Conesti committed suicide by hurling himself in front of a moving train. And five days later, on May 15th of 1911, Joseph was actually cleared of any involvement in Elsie's death. And it's just like, oh my gosh. You know, this was after he killed himself. He made this guy kill himself. Like, it's so messed up. A couple months later, police started looking for the writer of the letters and were set that were sent to the Parabek family because it's possible that this person who wrote the letters is the one who killed Elsie. They arrived at the home between, in between the corners of Madison Street and Roby Street, but unfortunately nothing ever came from this. Two years later, on the exact day of the second year anniversary of Elsie's murder, Frank Sr. passes away at the age of 45 for undisclosed health reasons. Carolina ended up passing away several years later on December 9th of 1927, which it was six days before what would have been Frank's birthday. Still to this day, Elsie's case, little Elsie's case has never been solved, and there's never been anyone who's been publicly identified or listed as a suspect in her killing. And I think because of how long it's been since she was since she died and everything, you know, it's been. Ugh. 111 years. I just feel like this case will probably never get solved and I feel like the family will never get closure to what happened to their little girl. I just hope and honest to God I hope and pray that Elsie is okay. She's in heaven and she is with her family reunited again. And that's something that I always think about when it comes to the murders of people and the cases I cover. I always think about whether or not they meet each other up back at the end. If there is, you know, another another part of this life that we don't know about. I I really like to I would like to know that and understand that. So as you know, I always like to add my opinions and everything to the cases. And like I said, I mentioned my opinion earlier. It is kind of possible, I would say it's possible that she ended up getting uh, kidnapped possibly by someone who was watching the children outside with the, um, 
organ grinder and thought it was a perfect opportunity to snatch her because she was a gorgeous little girl and ended up, you know, sexually assaulting her and killing her. That's just my opinion. That's my theory. I do not believe that gypsies at all were in any way, shape, or form were involved. But there's no, because there's no evidence that even, like, shows what had happened. Like, there's there no, um... DNA taken because there was no DNA done back then. I feel like if it happened now and they were able to get DNA done, they could probably see if there was any sperm that was in her body and it could have been used to catch the killer. But unfortunately, like I said, with all these years that have gone by, it just seems like if the case might never be solved. So I would love to know what your guys' thoughts and opinions are about this case down below. Do you think it was the organ grinder that took her? Do you think it was gypsies? Do you think it was a sexual predator? What do you think happened? And also, like, say a little prayer for the family as well. Like, I understand, you know, they're all resting peacefully now, but it's still such a sad case. It's so horrible. And I would love to know what you guys think of that. So... That's all I got for you guys today. Happy Friday, you know. And don't forget to hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, hit that little notification bell so you never miss any one of my videos. Because a lot of people have been saying that they've been missing my videos and don't know when I post them. So, yeah. Just make sure you subscribe and everything. And I'll see you guys in my next videos. Bye!